So um, now um, I'll uh, introduce Jean Gris. Um, so uh, for many of you, you're probably um, familiar with Jean Gris, um, but he is the OSU CCBBI facility specialist, um, AKA the um, jack of all trades and master of quite a few. Uh, so uh, Jean Gris received his PhD in neuroscience from USTC China and has been at OSU for over nine years. Um, please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Jean Gris Lee. <laughs> you can go ahead and take it away, Jean Gris. Thank you, Alison. So, uh, thanks uh, for everyone being here. I'm glad so, to see so many people. So, today I'm going to talk uh, something, uh, some tips about uh, uh, image acquisition at the CCPPI. So, uh, there are uh, here is a major list of something we need to do uh, for for MR study. So start from something like IRB application uh, till the end. We get uh, uh, data analysis and publish our result. But today my focus will be only uh, on two of the things, mainly on the data acquisition. But as a data acquisition is closely related to the stimulus presentation during the data image data acquisition. That's why I'm also mentioning, mentioning something about the stimulus presentation. So uh, we have uh, two computers. Uh, if you have been in the uh, control room, mainly uh, two com uh, more than two, but two critical ones. One is the computer, same as the computer control the uh, image data acquisition. The other one is the stimulus computer, our experimenters uh, uh, control to present the uh, stimulus to the participant. So we have a mechanism to synchronize the two computer. That's very critical for a lot of uh, functional scans. Uh, for uh, also we uh, functional scan, and we call it EPI because that's the uh, scan the sequence we use echo planner uh, imaging. So the way we synchronize the imagery acquisition and the stimulus presentation is uh, by the uh, pulse from the scanner computer. Uh, that pulse, we, we send the, uh, the scanner computer send that pulse at the beginning of, of every TR, that's the repetition time uh, terminology uh, in scanner and uh, DICOM. So for convenience purpose, we convert that electrical pulse to a key press five. So our stimulus computer can simply recognize that pulse by a key press five. That's equivalent to we press a five at the stimulus computer. So one question, uh, two uh, approach that people often use is uh, because the scanner comp scanner gave us a trigger at the beginning of every TR. For example, uh, most people are using TR with one second. That means every one second, the scanner will press a key five. That's kind of annoying, but that's kind of, a, if we watch it, we will see five, 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 while, while we are uh, hearing that something that a tapping noise, like da, 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 da. we will see one five every, one second. So here, uh, one question is, uh, do we use every trigger from a scanner or we use only the first one? So uh, practically, we, can, we could uh, use every trigger, but that's most, uh, most of the cases and that's not the best approach. So my recommendation is uh, we only use the first trigger. So uh, that means we first start our stimulus program. Our program will wait for the key press five. Once we receive the key press five, we know, oh, scanner is starting to acquire the first image. So then at that time, we, uh, we, we use that timestamp as the, the time zero for our stimulus presentation on the stimulus computer. So uh, uh, people, some people, I know some people use 
all the subsequent fives. So uh, the, their concern is a, is a very uh, uh, valid concern is the, uh, the uh, scanner computer and the stem computer are running two clocks. So for, for example, our TR is one second, then scanner computer will send a five every one second based on its own clock. But our stimulus computer, we present stimulus based on the stimulus computer clock. So we, sh we will try to match our stimulus uh, based on the clock, like one second, we will do something. After a couple of seconds, like five TRs later, we will do another thing, present something else on the stimulus computer. That's based on the stimulus computer clock. The two clock, in theory, may drift apart. That's definitely true. So that's what uh, some people you try to read every trigger, then they don't use the, uh, rely on a stimulus computer clock too much. They, they uh, rely on the uh, timestamp of every key press five, that, that is the scanner trigger. So that's really a good thought, but practically that's not ideal because the clock drift in a typical functional scan for, for uh, let's say, typically it's like around maybe 10 minutes, oftentimes it's between five and 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. So within that time, if, even if there's a clock drift, the drift is uh, on the order of a 10 to 20 millisecond. So I, we know that's nothing for for uh, in terms for for functional scan for EEG scan that may be a bad thing, but for functional scan, no, we don't care about twenty or even one hundred millisecond at all. On the other other hand, when we read the key press five, the times the accuracy of the time key press five the time time stamp is often much larger than ten twenty millisecond. So it. Now, now you should get the point. It really won't make a difference. We want to be accurate, avoid the drift, but the error we read the key timestamp is much larger than the real drift. So practically, it doesn't make sense. That's why you simply, we simply read the first trigger, start plan our stimulus timing, and ignore the subsequent fives. Uh, that's my recommendation for first or all the triggers. The other one is definitely that we should use, stick with use absolute onset time rather than relative, relative timing. Uh, maybe it some, sounds weird. If I give an example, it, uh, it will be easy to understand. For example, if we, we get the timestamp for the first key press five, that's start our, uh, one, our, uh, our uh, EPI acquisition. So we treat that time as a zero. We know the, the timestamp is not zero, but relative speaking, we treat them as time zero. So oftentimes, oh, I wait 10 more seconds or 12 more seconds. Uh, then I'm gonna start my trial one. So the absolute time means, so we use that time, uh, time step that we call T zero, plus five, plus 10, that's the, time where I, I'm going to start my first trial. Rather than wait for uh, 10 seconds, I start my first trial. That wait for 10 seconds, I call it relative time waiting. If I record times a T0 plus 10, that's the absolute time. I wait till that time step, then I step start my trial one. So that's the absolute time step. Same thing for the subsequent trials. So we always try our best to use absolute uh, timing rather than relative one. For example, uh, after 10 trials, if we always use a relative, I wait for 10 seconds, my first trial, my first trial, will, I will present a picture for four seconds. Uh, wait four seconds, I turn off the picture. Then wait another uh, three more seconds, wait for the participant to respond. 
Now, now we have a 10 plus 4 plus 3. If we always do that way, because the computer takes time to run some code, you know, after a, about 10, 20 trials, it always accumulate time error. We plan to run 17 seconds. Actually, it may run 17.1 seconds. After more trials, 20 trials, we accumulate error. That's the problem using relative uh, timing. So the, uh, always plan the onset of all the trials, then wait to that time step to start that trial. Okay, so that's uh, uh, something about the uh, one th uh, common error people often make in their stimulus design. So uh, the next topic I want to talk about uh, why the acquisition uh, takes longer than my stimulus. Ideally, they should be exactly the same because we want to synchronize them. But in practical, practically, we often see something like this. For example, uh, my stimulus designed for exactly 400 seconds. That should be six minutes and 40 seconds. But when we set up the uh, scan protocol. Uh, if we set uh, TRS1 and 400 environments, that will take 400 seconds. That should match our stimulus exactly. But the stimul uh, scan computer tells us uh, it takes six minutes, 47 seconds to finish the scan. So we see a seven seconds extra. Uh, in the past, I always try to avoid talking about this because my point is uh, we, we really don't care about that seconds, except it, uh, the scan not takes exactly 400, uh, six minutes, 40 seconds, but it takes seven six seconds extra. So it doesn't help us. Uh, often my worry is to confuse people. But it seems that people often ask, why is that? Why is that? So I'm going to explain that in a very simple way. So when people ask me, why is that? I often simply tell them, the scanner needs some time to prepare to start the acquisition. Actually, that's not exactly right. So uh, it, it takes something extra time, but that's something that's more extra, not the seven seconds. The seven seconds actually scanner is doing something within that seven seconds. Uh, uh, strictly speaking, the scanner is making the noise. When it's not scanning, it's quiet, it's, there's no noise. Uh, within that seven seconds, it's already start to make noise, but it only makes noise. It won't take any, won't uh, take any pictures and Importantly, it won't send that pulse, the five, to the stimulus computer. So it only sent the five after seven seconds, after it make, start to make noise. So that's why we don't worry about where, why it's seven seconds. Actually, it's not exact seven seconds. Depending on the sequence, it could be up to 20 seconds. Is really, we, we can't tell. It's seven seconds, 13 seconds, or 20 seconds. And we don't care about that. So because it won't do anything, and it won't send the five, that's critical for us. It only send the five when it starts to acquire the first image. So that's why whatever, six seconds, 20 seconds, we don't care. It's just some extra time. It won't affect our image acquisition. And uh, uh, actually, it takes some picture, but it won't save it. So that's why I call it uh, here, we have uh, some T1 effect. So uh, when we, uh, you know, uh, if you have an analyzed uh, functional data, oftentimes people skip first couple of volumes to avoid the T1 effect. For a Siemens scanner, uh, strictly speaking, that's not necessary because it already takes some extra time 
without saving those pictures. So you could use all the pictures from the very beginning in terms of a T1 effect. You won't say the T1 effect because uh, uh, it takes, takes care of that by scanner. But on the other hand, when at the beginning, when subject uh, see something on the screen, uh, we know all those things cause some response in our brain. So for that purpose, it's still a good practice to get rid of uh, some volume at the very beginning of a run. It's not because of T1 effect, because that has already been taken care of by the same scanner, but the because of a subject was seeing something on the screen. That's something, some response some, uh, in the brain we don't want to. That's why we, for that purpose, we, it still makes sense to uh, skip something at the beginning. So this is something I just talked about, no trigger during this extra time. That's something we don't worry about. So uh, do we need to discuss some volumes at the beginning? That's your call. But mainly it's not because of a scanner issue, it's because of a participant issue, a response issue. And uh, for this purpose, but the problem, a per principal problem is uh, what happens if the, our stimulus missed the file? So, uh, in that case, because uh, the scanner computer will set subsequent file, if we miss the first file, it, our stimulus computer doesn't know we missed it. So it will pick up the second one. If we also miss the second one, pick up the third one. In that case, we are in trouble because the scanner already saves pictures while stimulus computer doesn't know. So uh, that's uh, something that's hard to uh, detect. That's why I, I'm stressing here, when you program your stimulus, you will uh, make, uh, do something in your stimulus code. When the stimulus code receives the first five, it shows something on the screen, not a dramatic screen change, but a very subtle display change, just to show us the experimenter, not the subject. We want to hide that from subject. So then we will watch uh, oh, the scanner is gone. Da, 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 da. After about six, seven or 10 seconds, we will see, oh, our stimulus computer received the trigger five. So we make sure we won't miss that, uh, miss the first trigger. Because but once miss the first trigger, it will ignore the rest, that's fine. That means something is wrong. The five is not there or, or is there but not detected by our stimulus code. That's fine. We will debug it, figure out the problem. But problem is if we miss the figure, first one triggered by the second one, then our timing is off. So for that purpose, I uh, propose to the Siemens, so give us an option. So uh, the option is I proposed is to uh, allow a sequence, EPI sequence, only send the first file and one set subsequent file. In that case, if we miss a file, our Similar to one start. So then we, we know, oh, something's wrong. But I doubt they will take my suggestion. So they, because the scanner, you know, uh, our research facility, research sites is only a small part of, of their, their customer. Their major purpose is the clinical side and the clinical side, they don't care about this at all. So uh, now I, talked about the extra time, seven seconds or 20 seconds, whatever. So oftentimes some, uh, when uh, we try to synchronize, we often, st we, the good practice to start stimulus first, then tell the, uh, the technologist, tell Darren, oh, my, I'm ready. You can start the uh, image acquisition, the, uh, acquisition. Then there's a continue button there for all the functional scan. There uh, we will click the continue part button, then the scanner is to going to take uh, some extra time, then it's going to send the first file. Because we know there's a, some uh, at least seven seconds between the, we click continue button and uh, it send the first file. So if Darren clicked continue a little bit advanced, and you haven't 
press a button to start to wait for the file, that's not a problem. You can catch up within that time window. It's not the best practice, but you don't have to ask Terra, oh, stop it, I haven't started. You can quickly start. It has a plenty of time. Oftentimes, I thought it's a, a seven to 20 seconds. Uh, but if your code takes a long time to load images, it's better to start to ask Darren to stop. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, There's a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, are you able to see those? Uh, I'm not paying attention. Uh, <laughs> uh, the chat, uh, where is the chat? Okay. Okay, uh, well, what's the best way to calculate the difference between the stimulus and the scan computer? I would imagine it would vary based on the machine as something. Uh, that's asked by you. Uh, can you, uh, yeah, you, uh, you can talk, Alison, right? Yeah, I can. Yeah, so I guess I was just curious about like ways of actually calculating the difference in, in timing between the stimulus and scanning computer. Um, so that, you know, perhaps if like for whatever reason your stimulus is really um, large, like say it's like a video or something like that, um, that could continue to lag over time in a, in a way that's maybe more dramatic than visual stimuli that are just plain images might not, you know, is there the, like a really good way to get an accurate measurement of, of what that lag time is between the two computers? Oh, uh, I, I got it. So I kind of, I didn't, kind of didn't understand your question. So in that case, for the functional study, uh, it probably, it's not good. That's a problem with stimulus computer. So we try to solve that problem before we can run experiment. But for a functional, functional study, uh, imaging study, it's probably not an issue. If, uh, if we stick with the absolute timing for each trials, for example, if one of the trials, we have a lag for either because of the image display or the uh, movie play that happens. If that, there's a lag, uh, we plan to play the video for three seconds, but it lasts three and a half seconds. Uh, that's not the best, but we know if we use the absolute time, after a couple of seconds later, we uh, plan our next trial, our next trial will be on time. It won't be affected by the lag of the previous uh, uh, prob timing problem either for video play or image display. That's another important thing. We stick with the absolute onset time, not a relative one. Uh, so, but uh, in that case, it's be uh, better to fix the problem for the stimulus. That's a stimulus presentation problem. So the uh, timing issue is, uh, uh, we know the stimulus timing when we, uh, design our stimulus. Then we know exactly how many seconds. Then on the scanner side, we will set exactly the same sec number of volumes uh, times TR. That's our time for the stimulus, for the uh, scanner to acquire image. Okay, so that, uh, the other question is, uh, so we don't care about the first seven seconds because our time step stimulus presentation doesn't begin until after that. That's exactly right. So that's why in past, I never, I tried to avoid this topic because I, once we talk more, we, we cause more confusion. So it, it, we really don't care about seven seconds, 10 seconds, because it's right before anything else. It's before stimulus presentation, it's before image acquisition. That's exactly right. So we don't worry about that. Okay, uh, let mo let's move on to the next topic is about the, pace uh, uh, or uh, uh, so online motion correction for, uh, from the scanner. Pace is the uh, uh, same as the terminology, it's called a prospective acquisition correction. And uh, it's actually, it's a very advanced technology. Uh, the basic idea is uh, uh, 
during a functional scan, if a participant moves head at a certain point, then the scanner will uh, do a motion correction, detect, uh, detect that movement. For example, uh, after third, vol third uh, volume, and there's a movement. Then fourth volume, the scanner still, used, still acquired the image, and by compare the fourth uh, image and the third image, it detects a motion, oh, whatever, it's a rotation or a translation. Then start from fifth volume, the scanner is going to do something uh, to move the acquisition box according to the uh, detect motion. Then try to uh, uh, acquire the same brain region as the third volume. That's what uh, the pace does. So it's not the, like the offline motion correction. Mo offline motion corrections, a, we already correct the image. We detect the motion. Then we do a whatever translation rotation to match the brain pictures. That's the motion correction for the data during the data analysis. For a pace, it's during the acquisition, the scanner detect the motion and change the acquisition coverage to match what we need for the coverage at the beginning of the acquisition. Uh, that's kind of a, a very advanced uh, technology. It sounds pretty good, but uh, as you can see, I see it's a controversial. People rarely use it in the field. And for a couple of reasons. One reason is that people argue that the pace is not good for uh, some kind of motion. For, uh, one argument, argument is, uh, for example, if I uh, had a sneeze there, <clears throat> okay, between third volume and the fourth volume, I sneeze. During the sneeze, my head definitely moves. Then the fourth volume, the scanner detect motion, and start from fifth volume, it changed, to, uh, changed the acquisition box somehow to match the third one. But sneeze is a very brief. Actually, after a star, start from volume five, my head is already back to the original location of the third volume. But scanner changed the, changed the uh, uh, coverage in box. So that means the fifth volume is actually off. That's true. So then what happens? Then start from sixth volume, huh? compared to fifth, oh, they are different. Uh, so uh, it will t volume six will change again back to volume three. Then starts volume six is matches the uh, volume three. In this case, Volume four is messed up because I sneeze. Volume five is messed up because of the scanner. Scanner thought it, it figured out to do something smart, but actually my head is already back to the original location. So that's one argument that people see. You messed up one more volume. Uh, volume five in this example. Yes, that's true. But I think that's uh, not a critical one. So, uh, uh, because the chance we sneeze during a scanner is uh, not that high. And uh, oftentimes the pace is uh, very good for the slow head motion. That often happens uh, something like because of a pad uh, sinks or subject, subject is not comfortable make a, a certain change, uh, just one uh, movement at a certain point. In that case, pace is pretty good. It will pick that motion, correct the data acquisition. And in theory, pace is the only thing, only technology that corrects the so-called spin history. Maybe uh, most people are not familiar with that terminology. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, the basic idea is this. Uh, uh, we know the scanner does uh, something called shaming at the beginning of uh, acquisition. The shaming is to try to figure out where is the uh, head. And, oh, here's the head, here's the brain, and outside the head is, we know is air. Or even we know inside, inside the ear canals, there is 
those are air. Basically, the shaming process figure out those kind of uh, where are tissues, where are um, airs. So if we move the head, that, mo that movement will mess up the shaming because the scanner knows at this location, oh, it's an air chamber, that's a ear canal. It doesn't know it's a ear canal, but it knows it's the air. Uh, if we move, that will mess up. But it, with the pace, because it will change the data, uh, change the acquisition box, it will still uh, explain that correctly. Without pace, we after we movement, we still acquire the same you know, uh, same location in the space, but it's a different brain region. Uh, uh, we know um, after we moved, in the image will want a line. We need to rely on a post uh, pre-processing that one the step is the motion correct. Now that's we correct that. But the motion correction only align our images. But during the acquisition, because of the scanner thought that part is the uh, air, but actually after move, it's not exact air. That will mess up the data acquisition. The pace will take that. That's only technology, take care of that. And another major issue people don't like pace is they thought we don't have the motion information if we use pace. Uh, actually, that turned out that's not true. We know during data anal analysis, especially for uh, resting state data, anal data analysis, we all need a motion parameter from the motion correction as a uh, uh, some kind of regressor to uh, regress out the motion artifact. We, we, we are familiar with that. People thought, oh, once we use the pace, we, have, we don't have that. It turns out that actually Siemens saves that information in the uh, DICOM images. That's not a concern. I, I think that's a major concern people uh, avo try to avoid to use that. I, actually, that's not true. So if uh, surely we need to get that information from the DICOM file. So if you have only the image, it's not stored in the image, it's stored in the DICOM header. So that's not a concern at all. So uh, talking about so much about pace, my stress is that we, uh, if we are, you are planning a new, new study, you can ser seriously consider to using it. Because the, uh, the, uh, the argument that people use against to use it it's really not that valid. That's my, uh, my uh, opinion. So uh, the other things, uh, 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 the uh, online motion correction, the people often like to use pace is uh, if people do real-time fMRI. So in that case, we know uh, uh, motion correction is really slow. So for if when we do real time fMRI, another computer is taking in, getting the image on the real time and the computer something. Uh, we want to get the analysis done as quick as possible. That's why we, in that time at that situation we will likely use the online motion correction. Uh, online motion correction pace are not exactly the same thing. Even we don't use the pace, uh, the same scanner has an option to perform motion correction for us. It will save another series, double the, it doubles the image size because it will have original image uh, series and the motion correct image series. The real-time correction will can use the real-time uh, motion correct series. It will save time for the motion correction. Uh, with the pace, that mo uh, uh, we can always turn on that one. So it, it two separate topic. So talking about motion correction, so here's the, uh, the uh, one of the problem we often talk about ah, when we, during data analysis, too much motion, the subject data capacity, that's uh, I call it the number one enemy for the functional data. So maybe you think it's number two, but uh, anyway, it's uh, really a problem. Oftentimes it's a problem for us during data analysis. But unfortunately, during data analysis, there's no best way to fix that. So that's why I emphasize 
if we can do something during data acquisition to minimize the head motion, that will be the best. So one thing I, uh, so we can do is make, make sure subject is comfortable there and we pat their head, head so they are comfortable, they can stay still within one hour, one half an hour, it's long. It's a long time, long. Often it's a, a less longer. And uh, that's, uh, we, we have the padding, uh, try to help that. But for the experimenters, uh, we, uh, we should instruct the participant properly. That oftentimes is helpful to minimize the uh, motion. Uh, oftentimes we say, oh, try your best to stay, sti uh, stay still. Uh, st uh, stay still like a statue. Yeah, that's what we expect. But if you have been a participant, you know that's impossible. For one and a half an hour, you stay there like a statue. It's kind of impossible. So then what's the best? If that's impossible, so we will want important instructions to tell them, if you want to adjust your head, try to do it between the scan while we are giving you, giving you instruction for next task. During the scan, why, that's why when the scanner is da, 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 making a happy noise, try your best to hold your head still. And if you want to adjust, it's a couple of minutes. Each, each uh, scan will last a couple of minutes. You try your best to wait for the next break. So that's one thing we, we can uh, instruct them. Uh, and in case you, uh, they moved a lot between the scans, well, uh, we are, uh, oftentimes we give them the instruction for next scan. So in that case, we will add a additional uh, shaming because I, as I told you, the shaming is uh, for the scanner to figure out where is the tissue, where is the brain, where is the air. So if moved a lot, add additional shaming for the next scan uh, to let the scanner all figure out, update the information, where is the brain, where is the scan. Where's the air? Because that will uh, affect the uh, image quality. So uh, uh, that's uh, something we could tell subject. During a scan, if you want to move, if you want to scrub your nose, that's really bad. Wait for the next one. Oftentimes for this kind of situ situation, they could wait a couple of minutes uh, to the next break. So that will help. Uh, here's a, a firm I uh, sort of set up in our uh, uh, setup uh, in our in the control room. Uh, if you have a scan recent had a scan recently, you should have it now. It's called a frame wise integrated uh, real time uh, motion uh, MR monitor. It's developed by a group at uh, uh, Washington University of St. Louis. Uh, the basic idea is uh, like the real-time fMRI, uh, our scanner transfer the image to another computer uh, real-time for the functional images. Uh, after uh, there, there's one volume available, it will push the image to another computer like for the real-time uh, fMRI. But here is a, the, the other computer is going to do a motion correction compared to the previous volume. If there's a motion, it will give us a plot. Oh. There's a large motion there. Then we know on the real time, the subject is moving. So then we can uh, give us some idea of oh, next break when we give them the instruction, uh, we can tell them, give them a different instruction how to keep still. At least we know during the acquisition, it is uh, uh, the subject, we detect subject motion. Uh, that is a, there's a seamless computer, eye tracker computer. It's a, the setup is a simply a vertical screen in the middle. And uh, uh, here's a something uh, extra. So for that screen, uh, actually after we use that for a while, I develop our own firm's uh, uh, setup. So, uh, So uh, uh, after that, we, we, we are not using there, using mine, but it uh, has a, a lot of extra features. And uh, they, this is for the, uh, our, actually for not for our, for our 
own firm, and uh, I still use their borrow their name. Uh, it's very how to use it. You don't need to how to use it because you don't need to do anything. It's really user friendly. Uh, it will even help even wake up the screen by itself for you. You simply need to watch. Uh, this is our own. It's a lot of uh, extra uh, measure. First one is the real time image. Whenever there's a volume there, it will show you the image, the picture. Ah, oh, that's our volume. Uh, uh, participant ID, uh, it's the rest, series seven. That's an image one by one. And it'll show you the progress by this scroll bar. Uh, if the uh, acquisition is ongoing, it will, this one will last about uh, 400 something volumes. This scroll bar will keep going year, year, year. Once it's a year, oh, you know, it's almost that. And this plot is the motion information. Uh, we could use either use the VARS or frame-wise displacement. And it turns out this one is not good metrics for this purpose. It's often inflate the movement for the multi-band sequence. That's very popular in our center. That's why by default, I use the VARS. You could turn on this one, uh, show both of them. And uh, that's uh, some arbitrary threshold. Uh, green is good, yellow is uh, suspicious, red is bad. And here's a table to show each series, uh, and uh, both functional and structural. Then, and uh, one potential use is, the, I think the major purpose of this one is to show some information, and in, more importantly, the motion information. If we see a big spike here, here oh, that means uh, it's one movement. That's not a big deal. The often the bad case is frequent motion. Even the motion is not that huge. If it's a frequent motion, it will often cause problem for the uh, subject uh, for the data analysis. So uh, in that case, we will instruct the subject properly for the next scan. And it also has something once we have a, a short volume short functional scan and what think it's, it is the uh, slice check. So it will show you uh, something, uh, the brain coverage on, on another picture. You can take a look. You don't need to do anything. It will show you everything by itself. And the one thing you can do is uh, while the scanner, we are, while we are not doing functional scan, you could touch the one of the functional scan here. It's a touch screen. You could click one of them to check the motion trees. If you miss it, you can, for example, you can, oh, this, how about this run? How about this run? So uh, during the functional scan, it's taking picture one by one, it, will dis it won't respond to your touch. But if it's doing function, uh, yeah, structural scan or it's some uh, uh, field map or whatever, it's not a functional scan, you could check the previous series uh, for motion. Or you can, from manual, you can load previous subject to check one if, if you need. Uh, there's a question, form does not mirror location differences that happen between runs. That's correct. Form just, uh, uh, what it does is, uh, uh, it, it, what it simply does is the motion correction for the, uh, so like the uh, motion correction during the uh, data analysis. Uh, but it's a plot the, the motion volume by volume during uh, real time to give us the information. It won't tell us the, the, the uh, location change. Oh, actually that reminds me one thing. Uh, the pace, uh, the pace, what it does to catch the motion, correct, use a different uh, location to acquire the rest of the volumes. But uh, when we start next run, pace will go back to the original one. It won't use the new acquisition. That's kind of sad because if such a move, I hope it will catch the low, new location to keep using the new location. But unfortunately, that, that's not the case. 
is still not smart as I expect it to be. Uh, here's another brief topic about uh, brain coverage. And because uh, people, some people ask that, uh, like this one, oftentimes we do this one, like on the top is empty. Why do you, why do you uh, waste that space? Why don't, don't we scan more neck tissue? Actually, we inter like this one. Actually, I think this one's bad. We uh, try to do this one, even we waste some, uh, acquire some air. The reason is uh, our purpose is not diagnosis. We don't care about what happens in the neck. So we try to avoid get less neck tissue because that will uh, mess up the uh, brain uh, extraction during the data analysis because of some bright spot in the neck. Oftentimes, we need, if that happens, we need to use special software, software to get rid of the neck tissue. So that's the reason we prefer this one. It will give us a less problem. But still, sometimes it, for a certain participant, it will still give us problem. In that case, you still need to cut some off, set all this image below certain coordinate to zero to get rid of the neck tissue. Uh, that's a, a one reason. Uh, we keep often uh, keep everything straight, but that that was not in the center. Often we get try to get higher location to avoid, uh, to acquire less uh, neck tissue. People often, some people often I also ask, what's the something do you, you, we set up the. Uh, uh, functional coverage. Often times we mention ACTC. So uh, and those are two uh, anatomical marks uh, in the brain. It's called anterior commissure and a posterior commissure. In this picture, uh, the red spot is anterior commissure, the yellow spot is uh, posterior commissure. There are two tiny fibers connecting to hemispheres. So that's why we see them in the middle of the brain of surgical slices like this. But the best view we view them is through the axial slices. For example, in this view, this is the anterior commissure. Uh, if you, we go up and down a couple of slices, we, we will often see them in one or two at most three slices, because it's really tiny. It's especially for the PC, uh, often see that see it in all, only one slice or two slices. That Because it's so tiny, it's not easy to detect. But just because it's tiny, they are useful to, for the marks. If it's a large tissue, it's hard for our, to use it, because we want them to use that, them as a two points, so it should be very tiny, so to be useful. And the ACPC plane is the line along AC and PC. That's oftentimes used a reference for function, to set up functional slices, if they are the exo slices. And the, uh, years of we often people, some people say, oh, I, I want to use the, uh, my functional slices parallel to the ACPC plan. Some people say, oh, I need to, I want to use 30 degree from ACPC plane. That will give us a better uh, signal for the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, different, different studies show different results for that purpose. Uh, it's hard, one of our lab, Ian's lab, Ian Krepik, uh, uh, his lab seems to stress the 30 degree, like uh, not this one. This one's the opposite, this degree. They stress 30 degree this way is the best. Um, but how much better is the 30 degree is uh, really not that. Uh, maybe better, but isn't, but not oftentimes uh, is not that significant. And the other problem with the 35 degree, 30 degree is a larger angle from ACPC plane is with a larger angle, oftentimes we'll lose coverage. We need some more slices and 
more slices means if we want to cover whole brain, we need a longer TR. So that's another uh, trade-off for the angle. So um, my suggestion is uh, the whole brain coverage is uh, probably is more important than the, uh, the uh, orbital frontal dropout because the whatever we use, the dropout is still there. If your region of interest is at orbital frontal cortex or temporal lobe uh, close to the ear canal, there's a really no good way to, for that solution. But on the other hand, if you sacrifice brain coverage, I think that oftentimes is uh, the trade-off may, may, may not worth, but pretty, probably depend on your study. If your study, you have to have the uh, orbital frontal cortex is it very important, then probably we need to take care of that. So uh, in our uh, center, we often use a shorter TE. And oftentimes so you see it's a 28 centimeter If you look at other publications, the probably 30, 32, or even longer. Uh, by shorter uh, TE, we already uh, make the, uh, that dropout better by trade off something else, image uh, signal to noise ratio. So uh, if even shorter, it will give a better, but uh, we can't afford too much for the signal to noise ratio. Uh, that's kind of all, you know, in the setup for the fMR parameter, functional parameters is all trade off. So uh, if you want to discuss that for your new study, so yeah, we can do, we can go the one, one of the way to, uh, for those trade-offs. Uh, I think this is our last topic about today. So it's a physiological data. Uh, some of the study, they collect the data, uh, physiological data for, uh, uh, to, to get you, potentially used as a regressor uh, to clean up the functional data. So for us, we, uh, if you receive the data, uh, zip files, if we have a phase out data, you will get another separate zip files for, the, for, those, for both traces and regressors. You could simply ignore the regressor because that's, uh, I use some algorithm in the, uh, from other people to generate a regressor, uh, but probably you will use the traces. That's original, um, original pulse ox and the respiration, two traces. You, you could inc uh, include that into your analysis package. The package will likely generate the regressor for you. Regressor will be one point for each functional point. Traces is of 400 hertz, that means one second you will see 400 points. That's a very, you can, you can tell by the file size. Uh, regressors are so small, traces are so large. And uh, here's a whole session trace, uh, it's much larger. So uh, that's, uh, if you want to use, we have a documentation on our website, how to use that, how to use, uh, uh, they are fake DICOM files. Uh, I generated because DICOM file can include a lot a lot of extra information to explain what each, each file is for. Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, all for today. I think was, uh, I took a lot of time, much longer time than I thought. So uh, any other questions? Thanks, John Gree. This was awesome. Um, uh, I guess I know that we are just about at time. So if you have to leave, please feel free to do so. But um, if you'd like to st stick around and answer some questions, um, jean reed do you have a little time to do so? Uh, I'm fine. I'm free. Great. We may not be in the same room, but don't be shy. Yeah, you can just unmute yourself to 
if you had uh, as you don't have to ask at the word chat. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. So I, yeah, so I'm in Dr. Sagan's lab, so we work with kids all the time, and telling them to stay still as a statue for an hour and a half, I agree, um, isn't, doesn't always work very well. Um, so when we're training kids to uh, not move during acquisitions or to move maybe between acquisitions, how would you recommend we, do you have any thoughts for recommending how we train them? Like, can we tell them, you know, wiggle your fingers and toes if you need to, but try not to move your head? What are your thoughts there? Um, so that they're not moving too much between acquisitions, but so they can stretch a little bit. Uh, that's definitely understandable for kids. It's even harder uh, yeah. to, to ask them between steel. Yeah, that's exactly a very uh, critical one. That's why for a kids study, often the trade-off is that we may choose some parameter that's a less sensitive to motion. Uh, but that's another story for the parameter setup. For the instruction part, and uh, you know, the case is hard to, uh, it's even harder, I understand that. And I, I think the important one is uh, let them know if they can uh, wait, you can hold a little while, wait for the next break. Uh, the, the moment between the, during the break, even as it moved a lot, it's, it has much less effect for the data. Uh, that's because of us being history. If we move out, even they move out of the acquisition box, we, we could set up the slice differently to catch up. But if the motion is, uh, is within a scan, during a scan, that's really bad for, for the data. So uh, actually recently for during uh, when we uh, oh, uh, for, for those who are interested, uh, for the, the firm people, they published a paper about the multi-band sequence, uh, FD, frame-wise displacement. Uh, they published a paper. Their claim is the uh, frame-wise displacement is a, a kind of a not accurate. It doesn't reflect the real motion. It's often inflated. So actually the motion is not big, but we saw huge frame-wise displacement. So uh, the cause I'm mentioning that paper is related to this question. Is uh, they claim their claim is because the uh, breath when we breathe, our chest goes up at the down. The breath caused the disturb the B zero field that caused some fake movement. Even our head stays still. So for that sense, even the head stays still. If the leg, legs move, arms move, it will definitely disturb the B0 field. It will cause some fake motion. So, uh, but on the other hand, uh, I don't care that too much. It will affect, it's kind of affect image quality because actually our head didn't move. It's arm moved, but when we compute the motion, it seems we have a head motion. That's because the image quality is affected. So uh, in that sense, we need to also instruct them not only keep the head still, but keep the whole body still. Right, and that's during a scan. But between scans, they can wiggle a little bit, and that's, that's not as bad as moving within the scan. Between the scans, they are free to move uh, legs, uh, arms, that's totally free. And uh, the head, they can also move, uh, uh, wiggle a little bit. And uh, if they get back uh, to the original uh, location, that's perfect. That won't affect anything. But the, mm -hmm. if they move, the off chances, the, the head location will change a little bit. Mm -hmm. If it's changed too much, we may need to adjust the slice coverage and better add a extra thing because that will affect image quality a lot. Right, and can you just for me, uh, wh who is the author of that paper? I'd be interested in reading it, the multi-band motion one. Uh, let me uh, go back to the firm picture. Oh, it's that paper, okay. Got it, thank you. 
I guess a, a follow-up question related to this. So um, you mentioned that people can basically add some shimming um, if they suspect their participant has moved more dramatically between scans. Um, but is there like a way to know if they've moved enough to warrant that or do you just kind of have to to trust them to report that they've moved dramatically and then do the shimming in that case? Uh, that's a good question. So I think our most real-time motion uh, uh, software, that, this we can tell us a lot. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, we see the last slice is almost empty. That's a good sign. Uh, we often intentionally leave that. But later, you see, you see oh, three slides are, are empty. That's likely the chance that the subject moved down, right? Or you see, oh, this empty, we have some tissue. That means the subject moved up. Uh, the, the other dimension, they could move. The other dimension is a very hard move because we have a pads around their head. The real, if they could move, is really not much. They of, oftentimes some movement, uh, actually in our current setup, they don't have a space to move up because we have a pad on the top, but we really can't restrict if they move down. So oftentimes you see, here's one empty slice, later you see three empty slices. That's the, uh, we can easily tell by watching this. The other things, uh, if they, uh, they uh, uh, I like one instruction. Uh, if you want to adjust, you want to move between, let us know. Uh, tell us, oh, I need the uh, one minute to uh, some uh, scrum my face, uh, scrum my nose. So I need adjustment, let us know. Uh, so in, after that, we will watch, we can watch that. So we will pay close attention if there's anything changed. But just to confirm, that doesn't update until the next scan is, is running, correct? So if they, if they do report a movement in between or like they really need to, to scrub or whatever, um, like is it best to just take the preventative action of adding the shimming before the next run or? Uh, for kids, yes, uh, you, we could run. Uh, add the extra shimmy, it will take about extra half a minute, uh, 20, 30 seconds, like that. So it's only some extra time, walk uh, with some time. But typically for uh, adult participant, it's not that necessary. You're right. So if there, you, we detect motion, we could do that. It's already late. We already started the scan. But if it's so too much, if we just start a scan, we could stop it uh, into 10 seconds. We could stop, restart the scan. Uh, and uh, uh, add an extra shaming that will uh, uh, correct that. And uh, if the, uh, another thing is, if the, this slice has a lot of tissue, that means we are missing top, top part of the head. We need to replace the slices too. In that case, we, we want to stop the scan to restart it. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I had a question, and thanks a lot for the great talk, Shane Green. Um, I'm you. wondering about how significant an improvement it is to use um, both pace and physio as like physio regressors. So for, for instance, with pace, you said it's best for people who have slow motion. So in other words, probably, you know, adults who are fairly okay at reducing their motion. So if, if that's the case that it's best for people with slow motion, um, how much of like in your experience, have you seen a visible improvement enough that it's really important to add these things? Uh, actually, I at here we have the 
a play sequence from almost day one, but there's till today there's no serious study really using it. So mainly because of the uh, people think we uh, we lose the motion information by pace. So I can't tell how good it is, but they a couple of years ago the pace is not new. It's pretty mature technology. They published uh, by Siemens, or it's, uh, often it's a contract by Siemens to other researchers. They po have a publication about that. It's a kind of a pretty good, uh, but I don't have a firsthand experience. Uh, regarding the physical signal, that's two thing. Pace is a try to uh, fix the motion during data acquisition. Physio is trying to correct some uh, artifact after data acquisition. It's trying to, if there's a uh, artifact caused by uh, breath or uh, heartbeat, and uh, use those regressor can remove some of the artifact. Great. Uh, for physiological regressors, assuming that it gets collected though, using that um, as a regressor, have people found that it's quite useful to have? Uh, yeah, there are papers about that. Uh, at our center, a couple of labs collect, collect that, and uh, uh, some labs, they collect it just in case they want to use it, but they don't use it. And uh, Per Cedarberg, before he left from uh, uh, Ohio State, he, his lab did some analysis at the very beginning. He is one of the PIs to propose to use to record the uh, physical data. Uh, after we record that, uh, he did something. He found those regressors find those uh, uh, brain region related to the to the blood uh, uh, the blood flow uh, significantly. So uh, uh, I feel kind of comfortable for that because one of the important thing for the physiological data is uh, uh, we have to again synchronization issue. We need to know it, where in the uh, physio traces is our functional scan volume one, volume two for a certain run. So that we currently, we rely on the time series. Recently, I improved by incorporating the TR trigger into the physical recording. And one of the physical recording channel is simply recording the TR trigger. That potentially improved the synchronization. I was not comfortable, confident for that. But after pair found that result, I, I kind of confident for the synchronization. Yes, that, that uh, helps. But uh, I, I'm confident uh, current uh, synchronization is pretty good. But I know other lab, other centers, uh, there's a real, they, their solutions are really not ideal. Even for the multi-band sequence, uh, they kind of don't rely on this because in the multi-band sequence, there's a, set of, there's a parameter allowed to start, stop physical recording for that specific run. But my test indicate their synchronization is really bad. So that's why I still use my solution rather than use the multi-band feature provided by multi-band sequence. So yeah, it helps. I, but you okay, won't see you. people, a lot of people won't use it. I guess it's a, the, mainly it's a synchronization issue. If you don't know where you are, where to match the trees to, the, to one of your, our series, the resting state scan, there's no good way to use it. Um, I hadn't fully thought through the like psychological implications of this, but I'm just curious about the capabilities um, of this firm software. 
Um, say you were running some kind of structural scan that was longer, maybe a DTI scan, um, and you wanted to give participants real-time feedback about their motion, is there a way to like display this output to the participant or to basically take it and turn it into a different kind of visualization um, on a stimulus computer? Uh, the uh, firm is mainly for functional data uh, because, uh, uh, you know, for functional data, uh, the computer acquire one, one volume, save as one file, and then we can let it uh, push to the, the other firm computer at real time so we can compute the motion information. And uh, we can display the trees like this one point by point during the uh, acquisition. It's mainly for the functional scan. For diffusion data, uh, it also, different data is a, uh, uh, scanner does similar way as the functional scan and also uh, send the file uh, in that, that case, not the volumes. It's the volumes, it's a, uh, one volume for one direction, but because of the diffusion volumes, their they intensity are totally different depending on the uh, gradient direction. So uh, uh, currently there's no motion correction for diffusion data. Uh, for structural data, uh, there's no way for that, no way to correct that, because we can have the image only after the scan is done. So once the scan done, if the move is moved, we, we have the image only after all scans are done. So that's why during the six minutes function, uh, structural scan, uh, we don't have any information for that. Got it, thank you. Yeah, but, but uh, uh, for the uh, uh, diffusion data, if you see motion, uh, you could uh, like uh, open a notepad or PowerPoint, type something on the screen, give some instruction, and it, it's hard to talk because uh, uh, during the noise, but you could type something on the screen. Uh, that's fine, it won't affect anything for structural scan, for DTI scan, but for functional scan, we don't have a good way because we are, uh, we are displaying slimness on the computer. We don't want to disturb that. For the resting state scan, oftentimes we don't want this uh, disturb participant. We put a fixation there. There's no extra way to communicate. Any other questions from the group? Well, if not, um, join me once again um, in, in thanking Jean Gris for this great talk. Ah, thank you. Thank you for so many people to come for, for coming. This was great. And, and um, we're hoping to um, potentially have some workshops over the summer months just to keep everyone connected. So um, look out for announcements about those. And um, also, um, if you haven't already, I just posted that um, Qualtrics link once again in the chat. Um, feel free to um, um, fill that out if you're interested in summer outreach. Um, if that's every, everything. Thanks so much again. It was so good to uh, see signs of life from all of you. <laughs> and thanks again, Jean-Gris. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.